Welcome to Where Parents Talk. My name is Leanne Castellino. Our guest today is an award-winning sports writer, investigative reporter, editor, and speaker. Luis Fernando Yosa is also a youth sports consultant who's coached kids and teens for 25 years. He's a father of five and an author. His latest work, co-authored with Kim John Payne, is called Emotionally Resilient Tweens and Teens. Luis joins us today from New York City. Great to see you again, and thanks for being here. It's good to be back with you. I was uh, so excited when you interviewed me back in uh, 2014 for our book, Beyond Winning Smart Parenting in a Toxic Sports Environment. Let's talk about the topic of your book. Uh, certainly timely, relevant more than ever. Take us through what is unique about this book versus what else is currently on the market. Well, it, back when we uh, came up with the concept in 2017 and proposed it to uh, Shambhala uh, uh, Publications, uh, Kim and I had read through dozens and dozens of books on bullying, books by bullying experts, and even books like Jody Blanco's, which was about uh, being bullied herself. And through through them all, what we noticed is that uh, is that nobody was using the power of story so in in all these books there was advice there was um direction there were the do's and don'ts but what was missing was the best way for both parents and kids to learn how to navigate through and empower themselves when they're in situations of social difficulty and that is by showing not telling and a story shows how things develop and then resolve themselves whereas a in a in a didactic situation you tell and teach and that's not how we learn best most clearly so, so go ahead so what we have here which has never been done before that I, that we know of because we couldn't find it you know when you write a book proposal you have to sort of touch on other books of this type in the market we didn't find any and but the story originally was going to be 10 or 12 or even ambitiously 15 stories that teenage narrators from the age of 16 to 19 who had been through social dilemmas social challenges and and really had a rough time but then resolved them somehow with the help of someone and by empowering themselves uh we're, we're, we're telling to younger people. So in other words, uh, a middle school kid with their parent could read this, uh, these stories. Could, they could be read to them or they could sit in a group and read them to each other as has already been done in several schools. I mean, we did one as a test, a pilot test, and it worked really well. Uh, and, and you learn through story. You don't learn through uh, advice because, as you know, as a parent, you can tell <laughs> – you know, your kids over and over, do this, don't do that. If you're modeling the opposite, or if you're just always criticizing them, it's not going to work. But if you model what you want them to do, or you allow them to see it happening outside of you, or if they simply learn from somebody else on the outside how, to, how they can change, then magic happens because change can occur. Otherwise, there's stasis. So why did you want to write this book on this subject matter at this time? Well, Kim Kim has been working on a social inclusion, um, development of so social inclusion programs for decades. And he has gone into schools to help change the social dynamic over and over and developed ver certain specific techniques that are very effective, that are great. He even did it in my school. Uh, the school that my kids go to, the Real Steiner School in New York City, and I saw how effective it was. I even attended some of the when, when I was doing the research for this book with him. I attended some of the uh, the no blame meetings that they had, and some of the uh, other techniques that were used. And they were sort of shepherded by teachers, but they were peer oriented sessions of learning and role playing and acting out, and then working with younger peers. So in a way. What he had structured there is modeled by the structure of this book, which is four chapters of advice 
pretty much the opus of Kim's developed social social uh, program. Um, and then these 10 stories in which uh, one young person goes through a particular type of difficulty, navigates through it with the help of a cousin, a mom, a coach, a friend, another kid in their class who they see doing something successfully and wonder, why doesn't that work for me? Why are they bullying me? Because I'm fat. Johnny, Tamara, and Jose are just as big as I am. In fact, one of them is way fatter. And yet, they're not being teased. So why me? And so they learn that a lot of what's going on here is your reactivity. How you respond to initial interactions that involve domineering, teasing behavior from a quote unquote, uh, you know, alpha person or, or hyper controlling person. Uh, that's where this happens. So what matters is that you're disempowering yourself by how you respond as a kid. And you really can't just say to a kid, hey, you're disempowering yourself by how you react and behave. Because first of all, it's likely that they're not at all aware of this, right? They don't know that they're mis that they're projecting a kind of a, a meekness or a eagerness, a, a desire to fit in that sort of is so palpable that it that it makes them just in a way, and it's a, a tough thing to say, I guess, but to the person on the other side of this, it's like you're begging to be teased. Because you're acting so meek towards, you know, anyway, it's more complicated than that. There's a lot of nuance. But the other thing that, that, that Kim explored in his studies, and I really, really respect, is the fact that uh, bullies, well, they're not just bullies. I mean, we think of the bully as the, 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 vic the um, you know, we often think about the bully as the villain and, and, the, and the target as, as the, uh, as the, you know, victim that is being marginalized, and that's all happening. But often the bullies are being bullied themselves somewhere else. And so they're trying to hyper control their little universe. So, an example a kid at home has no parental presence. So they are afraid and worried and not doing well. So they can't control a presence of a parent. So they control in their school their environment, hyper control it by being dominant and being really hard and bossy to other people. Or it can be more simple. The more common par uh, paradigm we have is a really mean dad or a really uh, controlling or tough tough on his kid's dad or a mom that just doesn't let her, her, her son and daughter breathe because she's always planning and fixing everything from them. So then they sort of project that onto the, the kids in their class. So what we have now is not a villain victim scenario but a child with difficulties rendering difficulties onto others and so you're not going to solve this uh by blaming you're not going to solve this by having uh you know, by r rushing into the parent teacher meeting and bristling with uh you know you can't do this my kids are being done this too did you see that email how could they post that because there's a larger picture here. Why is this being posted? Why is it being done? And one of the more complicated things we, we've noticed in the psychology of this, and Kim in his work with, with kids, he counsels parents daily now uh, uh, on, uh, on Zoom calls, as well as doing his broader work. And myself in all the 25 years of coaching I've done, and there's, some, there's a lot of similar strains here, is that is that uh, we, we really have to work with everyone. So when I've coached, I've had a kid who was aggressive and like bullying and taunting. Then I meet the parent and I say, oh, I see. I get what's going on here, you know? And so I can't educate the parent. I can't tell the parent, you got to stop bullying your kid. That'll blow up in everybody's uh, <laughs> backyard. Mm -hmm. But what I can do is work with the kid. So what do I do in this situation when I have a kid who is because their parents are high pressure, type A, push their kids personalities. I'll take that kid and who is aggressive and often these aggressive kids are really good. So he's like the best or the second best kid on the team. Let's call it let's use soccer because that's what I've dealt with mostly. 
And so he scores goals. He dribbles well. He passes. He's really fast. And he gets angry and impatient with the rest of his teammates. And it's really negative. And they don't like it. And it's a form of bullying. It's a form of marginalization. What do you do to it with a kid like that? Well, in extreme cases that I've seen over the years, you counsel the kid off the team. But there's a better way. And that is that you give this kid responsibility. You give him a challenge. You make him the, an assistant coach, either of that team, or if it doesn't work out, of a team of younger kids. And in one case, when I had some interesting kids on my team, we set up a program where we worked with disadvantaged kids. And my entire team in West Side Soccer worked every Saturday for five or six Saturdays with disadvantaged kids. And it was the kids who were hyper-controlling and the best who were pushy. When you're up against trying to show a disabled kid who either doesn't have control of their limbs very well or, or doesn't have the, the uh, spatial understanding or the, the physical capabilities to do something, and if you say to them, dude, that sucks, what are you doing? Oh, my God, like I could do that when I was three and, and you're 15 and why can't you do that? They're going to... They're going to cry. They're going to run away. They're going to start running out into the street, maybe off the park. You can't do that. So you learn, the kid learns without being told to measure their response. But even on a regular team, I had a kid who I made an assistant coach and he was like, dude, I just showed you how to do it and you're still doing it wrong. You suck. And then the other kid said, well, you know what? I don't want to play with anymore. And a couple of other kids said, yeah, you're mean. I've never heard an assistant coach do this. And they all walked away. So there I could have said, okay, this is not working out. Instead, I said, listen, notice how you behave and how they do, because you've got a lot to offer here. You're really good at what you do, and it'd be great if you could teach them, because you would make them better, and by learning, you'd become better. He tried. He learned more the social approach. The kids all got better, and he became very popular instead of a marginalized, you know, best player. It works. It's amazing how well it works. There's so much to unpack on what you just described. I mean, you provided some really relatable examples for people who uh, watch and listen to this interview at, who may be able to see themselves in what you've described in those examples, and it would resonate with them. But let me ask you, with your lived experience as a coach, you know, being a father of five kids, everything you've done in your career, what strikes you most about what is missing from the parenting standpoint or what is not happening from the parenting standpoint when it comes to building emotionally resilient kids? The, one of the key, I mean, there are many. Uh, one of the key ones is that we don't have enough self-awareness of our own, of how, about how our biography plays into how we interact with our kids. So we project on them what we knew as a kid when, when in, in a coaching situation or, or in a teaching situation. And by the way, let's broaden the term coach and not talk about sports because in every aspect of a kid's development, there is coaching or mentoring or teaching. So in teaching a kid uh, physics, in music, in archery, in tennis, in, in just modeling for them how to be nicer with, it, with other kids, there's coaching going on or not going on. But the, the key is, I think, for parents to learn how to step back and let the kids learn through their own mistakes and not zoom in and try and fix things. And we zoom in and try and fix things in a situation where there's actual serious bullying in a school setting or in a team setting. And we instead heighten the problem. It becomes a larger con conflagration. So, uh, and it doesn't help because one of the key things that Kim points out in the in the advice section is uh, in the parenting advice section, which is the first four chapters, is that kids uh, kids actually truly want to be friends with the kids who are bullying them. So you might say, what do you mean? I mean, in a domestic violence situation, you don't want to be you don't really want to be friends with the person who's harming you. But then again, you're in a relationship with them. And, and the idea at the beginning was to be partners so you did want to be connect with them and it isn't working so in a situation with a with with a kid it's often the most popular kids like the best athletes the best looking kids the most 
charismatic and confident who are the bullies. And frankly, if you're new to the school or if you're, you know, one of the kids who's kind of still figuring out themselves and in, 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 in arriving into their bodies or, you know, figuring out how to be socially and are a little mm-hmm. awkward, that's your paradigm. You do want to be popular. You want to be cool. Or you at least want to, you know, have connections and, and, and be socially okay. So they're the ones you actually want at some point to get approval from. And the whole reason you're being bullied is because you seek this approval in a, in a way that just <laughs> turns them into wolves and you into a, a, you know, a lamb they tear apart with their teeth. So you've talked about giving kids the language to some degree uh, if they are being bullied, teased or socially excluded. You've talked about making parents more aware of their uh, role modeling of behavior. You've got now social media that has in many ways fueled, exacerbated, amplified all of the things that we're talking about as it relates to bullying, social inclusion, teasing, etc. What gives you hope that it's even possible to tackle uh, building emotionally resilient teams, uh, teens against this backdrop of this intense, never-ending amplification on social media? Well, it's a brilliant question. And to think that I have, you know, a four-point a four bullet answer that'll satisfy it is me me being presumptuous and, and also just, you know, I just don't. But what I do know, and, and it is in, important, I feel, is that and we have a chapter, you know, we one of the chapters is about bullying without borders, because as you say, the amplification of social media, you can hide and bully somebody through social media. And not only are you bullying them and are you anonymous so you can say and do whatever you want and feel like there's never going to be consequences. Right. But you're also instead of bullying them in front of the class ten kids, the team, 18 kids. Uh, you're you're doing this on a where anyone can see it, and so the entire school can. So it's very tricky. Obviously, there are a lot of programs that that work with uh, administrations on this, but for the for the bullied child in these situations, it is often that we counsel that they withdraw from social media for a little while because if they do, and it's not. It's, it's kind of like the regular bullying. You take the power away. So if I'm bullying you on social media, uh, man, right, and I'm doing all these things and they're like, I'm doing drawings of you, I'm doing posts about you and making fun of you, uh, you know, sticking things on your nose and head and, and everybody's seeing it, but you're not there, then you're not adding any flame to that fire and it's not really fun for me. So like when you when I post something about you and then the next day, I get a friend of mine to say, hey, that was really weird. Did you see the post of you so that you'll run over and see it and feel bad or that you did see it and feel worse? The fact is, if you say, uh, I don't really I haven't been really going on, uh, you know, on my Insta for a while or. Yeah, dude, I shut off my snapshot three weeks ago because it was distracting me. And my mom was like, if you don't get an A in that course, you're done. What are you sending as a message? Yeah, you, you know, I'm not going to. And that's one of the key the key messages that we counsel in sort of a scripted response to bullying. You know, you can say that. Uh, I can't stop you. All right, so you can say it. I mean, I'm not going to say I I like it when you say that, but, you know, whatever, it's okay. And suddenly all that, you know, energy that's buzzing around in the field of anxiety that you were projecting earlier is not there. And they don't have any wood for that fire, no oxygen for that fire. And you're not an interesting target again. And so either A, they move on to somebody else, or if that happens enough, they realize, you know, I was being a bit of a jerk, dude. And you want to come and play, uh, you know, play hopscotch with us? You know, you're okay. And we've seen this. I mean, it's not like we're hoping this happens. Kim's seen it on playgrounds all over the world. And by that, I mean globally, not just in the U.S. and Canada. And I've seen it in coaching and in all my travels as a sports as sports writer in, at Sports Illustrated, everywhere. I, I used to go to playgrounds in every country. I used to check out things. I would I would even, while I was reporting on a, a you know famous athlete, take a break for half a half a day. Don't I didn't tell my editors this obviously, right? Uh, but I would I would go and play basketball or play soccer, and so I'd see how the kids played and how they reacted, 
and if they were amped up and negative with each other or if they were just having fun. And so it was like it wasn't purposeful reporting at the time, but it gave me so much material to learn and understand how things are the same and different in, in, in social settings throughout the world, not just in sports, but in society. And people tend to think sports, sports, but sports has become such a intricate part of our society. So if there's bullying and teasing and entitled behavior there, and those are the kids who often are, can be very difficult and controlling in the school. I mean, I didn't want to go down this path really, but when you look carefully at some of the most extreme forms of, of, uh, of dangerous behavior in school settings, often the, uh, the, the perpetrator of the, of, of, the, of the actions has said that when they were younger, they just wanted all this stuff to stop. We, I just wanted it to stop. And obviously they didn't, nothing good came out of the, the way they did it, but they were being bullied. And often it was by the jock culture or the popular, cool, sexy, too fast, too soon culture. So if we can work on the whole societally, through sports, through theater, through math class. I mean, think about it. You go to a chess tournament and everybody's trying to kill each other. You know, you go to a, a theater uh, audition and everybody's trying to be the, the lead role. And that's all fine. Competition is good and healthy. But it's the way we approach it that's really off. That, you know, you're win, you win or you're nothing. And in, in the stories, we have... Uh, these kids go through all these different types of problems. I mean, we have, we have, I wanted to go through a couple of the titles of the, of the chapters here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm cheating. I'm cribbing here, but we have rumors and whispers, which is Elena's story. Now she's a uh, Mexican in background and she lives in LA. We have stop pushing me around. And that's Michael's story. That's the only sto story we have here with strong physical bullying. Because it's really important to note that while we think of bullying as shoving somebody, giving them a wedgie, banging them around the lockers, the most in, the most sort of hard to deal with, hard to manage form of, of social ill in schools is actually marginalization uh, and, uh, you know, just not including people. And so we have, sto we have stories where... Um, uh five five girls are great friends and then suddenly one of the girls has dropped off a chat uh thread and everybody's talking about her there's cyberbullying in there there is learning um there's learning how to we even have a story where where a girl is hyper controlling and it's affecting her siblings because she's being mean to them and it's affecting how she interacts in first and second grade. So it's not all, not all middle school. There's a wide range. And in, the, in her situation, as she learns to stop having to control everything the way her mother had to when she was uh, younger, and, and they learn together that they're being too controlling, uh, they, they both have better interactions. But there's another story that really is at the crux of the simplicity parenting um, ethos. And that is that a lot of hyper-controlling behavior and a lot of the bullying, social, uh, social, social exclusion and marginalization, teasing happens because kids are, um, well, they're simply overwhelmed. Too much too soon, too sexy too soon, as Kim would say. Too, too difficult uh, in, the, in the world of scheduling. So we're trying to give them, as parents, we want to give our kids everything. We want them to have the best of everything, the best opportunities. But they shouldn't be playing piano on Tuesdays and running on track on Wednesdays and Thursdays and on the travel soccer team on Mondays for practice and all weekend at tournaments while also – you know, study for the PSATs because they're going to go bonkers. It doesn't work. And so there's a situation where there's kind of, I would say, a, a family bullying an envelope. Nobody's intentionally doing this. 
but you're overwhelming a kid. So I guess I, I'm trying to remember. I think it's in Sophie's story that through through being with her grandmother, who doesn't have uh, much access to internet, and who just wants to bake cookies with her granddaughter and hang out and they play cards, the overwhelm of the whole fall of school starts to sort of dissipate or fall away. And then she and her grand and she has a dream that's very kind of controlling and crazy and scary. And and while her parents and her older sister have gone back, she's asked to stay with her grandmother for a couple extra days. They have a wonderful time and they connect and she realizes, and her grandmother does, that she's been overwhelmed the whole time. And that's why she was getting sick more often. That's why she was her grades had started to dip. And that's why she was, you know, being a little too aggressive with other kids about the fact that she was a soccer player and a and a star. And so I've said a lot. We've been through a lot of this material and maybe a bit too disorganized, but you get the gist of what these stories are doing. They're transformative. They empower the kids and the par- and parents or coaches who work with them uh, learn how to script responses that they then, that they can then take uh, to the situation in school. But what that does is it's not that the mom or dad rushed to school and said this has to stop because that what happens then is the bullying goes underground. Now the administration doesn't know it's happening happening, but it happens anyway and it gets worse. Instead, the kids have learned how to handle themselves better. And so the bullying falls away. And what does that mean? I did it. It was me. I worked through this. Yeah, my mom and I worked on sort of a script of how to respond or my cousin made sure that I learned, you know, what I, how I was acting that was bringing this on. But the truth is, I did it. And the final, final thing that happens is that you come to a place in your, in your, in your body, in your soul, in your life where you feel the following you feel this and i say this to myself almost every day now when i'm overwhelmed you you, you think you feel you say i am me and that's okay so louise this project was about six years in the making on and off writing this book i'm curious as to what did you learn as a father of five and everything, again, that you have done in your career, what did you learn about how to build emotionally resilient kids? I guess I learned that uh, the number one thing I as a parent need to do is model better behavior, model calmness, m- model uh, stewardship. And to be frank, absolutely honest with you, I, I haven't always done that. And so... It's stunning as parents, you know, even uh, even when you're with your three year old and suddenly you hear them say. You're a bonehead and you don't know that they knew the word existed. And then you think, wait, like a few days ago, I called somebody a bonehead in front of them. So that's the key. You're on all the time. You're on a stage and they're and they're watching you. So when I get cut off and then I yell at the car next to me they're going to do that if i'm looking at my phone a lot while i'm driving they're going to do that uh how do you build resilience in your child you connect with them and you connect with them again and once you've done that you do it further because when they're in a state of either being a bully or being bullied they need you close they also need you to let go and that's why this book works is because you help them help themselves overbearing parents create either bullies or victims victims of of bullying they create marginalized kids or kids who marginalize others so you really need to know how to how to zoom in and help when they're vulnerable provide them with safe boundaries and also say basta is enough I, i don't like you behaving this way when you have to uh the resilience comes when uh, they feel your support, uh, but they also feel that they're successfully working through things themselves. And uh, it develops slowly over time. It 
you might think your kid has become really resilient and then something big happens or some growth spurt and they change developmentally and now they're, you know, they're vulnerable again. And, you know, that's, I mean, there are many more things to unpack there, but I think the key thing is for you to know when to come in close and know when to give them space. That's been a lifelong lesson for me and I have not yet fully learned it. In other words, it's about timing, right? It's about timing. And there are other things, which in the book, Simplicity of Parenting, Kim gets into in, in great detail. Things like having rhythm, having uh, pulling back on information. And in the key issue of cyberbullying, you know, you turn off that stuff. If, if they're being bullied, they, it, it's, like, it's like a heroin addiction or it's like your addiction to your Crackberry or your iPhone. You keep on going back because you want to know who pinged you because it might be something interesting or not. Well, the same thing with a, with a kid who's being bullied in, in uh, online or on social media. They don't want to see it, but they really want to know what it's about. And so if you, if you start peeling away the, this, this stuff that's coming at them all the time and that's coming at you, then there's an opportunity there for both of you to breathe. I mean, you can do it for the whole family. And that's the interesting thing with all this material. You don't just change. Bullying is not something that's happening to one person. Bullying, when it happens to any one member of your family, whether it's you at your job or your spouse uh, in the supermarket or your kids at school, everybody's a victim in the family. Because however it, 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 it has you react, you then project that onto others. So uh, I've had situations where it's really rough and competitive where I was work working and I felt really annoyed and angry and I'm coming home to a three-year-old, a five-year-old, a seven-year-old. And all they want to do when I open and they hear the crack of a, the key or the click of the, of the bolt is race from the couch where they've been waiting and standing there. Cause they know I'm there cause they saw me through the window and jump into my arms. So if I come with the fury that I feel because I didn't get a byline on that story that I worked on so hard, or that they gave the pitch that I that I sent to the uh, my editor to some more famous writer because they figured he'd do it better. If I bring that into my home, wow, it changes the entire dynamic and everybody's off. And I don't want to do that. And I'm still learning that. But one trick I was taught, which is really good, is before you open that door, before you turn that lock, just stand there for a second and breathe. And then let it all fall away if you can, or at least some of it. And then come in unclenched and embrace them as they run into your arms. And swing them around and go play with them on the ground, on their level. Not watching from above while you type away, you know, about where you're going to meet your buddy for golf next week. Or, you know, where you guys are going to hang out and what movie you're going to see when you go out on girls night. You know, you want to be there with them. That was what builds resilience is connection with 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 parents and and what builds resilience bottom line. I mean, there are tricks and and all sorts of, you know, bullet points that I can I can hit or or miss on uh, because I'm not a trained uh, psychotherapist or or psychologist. But that's the key. Connect with your kids and do it from a place that's that's grounded. Tremendous insight. Lots of food for thought. Luis Fernando Yosa, co-author of Emotionally Resilient Tweens and Teens. Thank you so much for your time and your perspective today. Thank you so much for having, uh, having me on.